History. History. Can you see, little boy, what you mean to me? Can you see how sweet I love is long grown to be? It's time to see the happiness I feel inside of me. Love will always be two lovers. History ain't that two lovers? History. Peaches and cream. Welcome to History Boys Abroad, episode 24 of our podcast. And the subject of this episode is someone on everyone's lips on Twitter recently, not Drake. It is the man, Georgios Samaras. The much lauded, much derided, much lauded, much derided Greek is under the lens on this episode. And for this one, I'm going to be taking over me, Tony, as the role of host. And I'm going to be joined by my usual co-host, Gary, based in Bogota. Gary, how are you doing? Uh, been better, but I've been worse. So, Do you care to share on this most public platform why things are not so rosy for you at the moment? Uh, I got my phone nicked yesterday from one of the lovely... Ciudadanos of Bogota. And where were you when you got the phone blagged? Uh, I was at a music festival, so I probably wasn't Compass Mentis. Was it the but, David um, Guetta one? No, uh, it was Erasure. All oh, right, Erasure are pretty good though. They are they're fucking brilliant, to be fair. Yeah. Also, and were, were you actually at an Erasure gig? No, is that, is that... no, I wasn't. No, but, okay. Uh, I wish I was though. Probably a nicer, a nicer class of person. Yes. So the voice that you do hear in the background as well is our former history boy abroad. Well, I guess he's still a history boy abroad. Still abroad, Graham? I am still abroad. Still in yes. Germany? I am, and it's enjoying the kind of spring weather and no exams, so just hanging out, doing nothing. Excellent. Yeah. So that's good that you've joined us. And the reason that you're back on this one is because we always had a... we Not not always, but we had a bit of a running joke about Samaras and how we would do a Samaras one eventually. And mm-hmm. you were always uh, indicating that you would like to come on and speak about that. So here you are. Um, it's happening. It's finally happening. And it has to be said, the Twitter feedback and the feedback on the, of the, over the forums that we use has been absolute fire. Like, so many updates, so many notifications, so many people. So many people kind of arguing with me, arguing with other people, saying he's this and he's that. And he really, really does split the people. He really does divide the people now. One reason is we're doing this is because we kind of wanted to do it in the past, Graham, but we thought we'd hold off because he just kind of left. The second reason that we're doing it is because we put out a Twitter poll for people to vote on who they wanted to be the next guest, or not the next guest, the next subject of the podcast. And Samaras was just like 60% out of four other, out of four, 60% out of four. So that's one of the reasons. But the main reason we're doing them is because, let's let's be honest here, is there been a player, has there been a player in your lifetime as a Celtic fan that has divided the support as much as Samaras? I would I would say not. I, he is the kind of person that appeals to a lot of a lot of fans in one way, but he also really turns off a lot of people because of the way I think it's his haircut has got a lot of th- a lot to do <laughs> with it. His mannerisms on the park, the way that he I know a lot of Celtic fans got kind of uh, irrationally angry at the way that he would put his hands over his face after he's yeah. made, missed a chance or something, and the way that he would f- kind of move his hair out of his eyes and things like that. There was a kind of like uh, aggression towards him being, I don't know, maybe not as masculine as other players. And I think that that was something that maybe drew kind of the ire of some fans when it looked as if he wasn't getting like his sleeves rolled up and getting kind of sweaty and ready for the battle. And he was maybe looking too much like a model, you know? I think that was quite a common misconception, in my opinion, before... Now, bearing in mind, I'm, I'm the host for this tonight. I am not. I haven't done a great deal of research. You guys are, and I'm hoping to learn from it. But one of the misconceptions that I've, I came across, and this is just from what I already knew, was that he was a bit of a heart of a mouse, didn't really dig in enough when the going got tough and just seemed to sort of blend into the background. But I actually don't think that was true. Gary, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think when people kind of get on one side of players like like this, they become very entrenched and they end up, uh, the people who love them really 
exaggerate his qualities at times, and the people who hate him will just exacerbate the things that uh, that they see wrong in him. Um, the only other player I can think of in a similar tit away would have been Agat. I think Agat got a bit of a got a bit of a, that kind of rep. And, you know, you either loved him or hated him at times. But the difference I think was that Didi Agat played in a Celtic team that was successful basically throughout his whole time there. Whereas you know Samaras is really he's went off the full scale. There's been some some of the, some of the more loved Celtic teams of as of late. He's been a part of. And some of the more successful ones as well, um, but yeah, I think I think personally, I think it's a misconception that um, about uh, him not having heart. But I suppose it's just it depends on how you see football. I mean, if you think Hearts uh, running around flying into challenges and so on, I would say it, I would say he did because even despite the fact that he got a lot of stick, um, he never. I, I don't feel they ever particularly had in games. I think that was one of the misconceptions about him that I think he, he always looked for the ball and stuff like that, even if things weren't really coming off for him. The one of the things that I came across, which I, someone had mentioned on one of the forums, now we're just this will be the first question before we actually start. Graham's going to start for the first part of his career was that you could tell the sort of player Samaras, the sort of performance he was going to give by the warm up that he was given on the pitch, like before the match, and that sort of tells you the scrutiny he was under as a Celtic player I think as you say people overlooked over, sorry over scrutinised everything he done because they thought maybe he wasn't a big bad hard man on the pitch or something but I don't believe that to be true but I think that will take us into basically his career how he started his career because when he came to Celtic he was still relatively young Graham that's right yeah I mean looking back it's it's amazing he's basically had maybe what a fourteen year career at this point because he broke into the first team at Herevin at the age of eighteen. So I mean he's been going a long time as a professional footballer, and obviously he's had quite a lot of clubs as well. But going back to that kind of the early days in Holland, before you you, you said to me kind of uh, figure out what you thought of Samaras before you did the research as well, and I I had in my mind that he'd scored a lot of goals in Holland, and you know they're always talking like the. Football Weekly podcast about Dutch goals being like dog ears. Yeah, Matija Kesman and Alfonso Alves. Aye, that kind of thing. So I thought he was actually along that, uh, kind of the lines of that. But he didn't actually score that many in Holland. He came into the first team, as I said, at age 18. He scored a few goals in his first few games off the, off of the bench. But he was never really a cons- consistent goal scorer over there. I think he ended up with something like... Uh, in the last season and a half, he ended up with something like one in every three games. So I mean, it wasn't bad when you when you think of a kind of like second forward, you know, like not a number nine, but maybe someone that's just kind of supporting the striker. So it wasn't that bad a record, but it wasn't as good as I actually thought it was. I thought he'd scored like twenty five in one season, which just wasn't the case at all. So I think he actually got twenty five in the eighty games or something over his whole uh, Henry career. So did you, did did you but, sorry to interrupt? Did you did you find out how he made the switch from Greece to Holland? It, well, basically, Henry were like his first professional club. I think he played for the uh, OFI Crete uh, as a as a youth, but he had never made any kind of like professional game uh, like uh, debut yeah, with them. I, so he was still a youth player when he moved to Holland. Yeah, I see. Just to interrupt, like, I came across this just by chance. I haven't done a lot of research here, but I happened to be... I googled Georgia Samaras Heerenveen, or, or Heerenveen in 2006-2007, and um, mm-hmm. it took me onto the Wikipedia page of... the Dutch Wikipedia page of Heerenveen, and I clicked into Samaras in that season. It took me to this, this, the Dutch Samaras uh, Wikipedia, which was different from the English one. And the Dutch one said... Okay. The, the, this, was not, this was not found unless I was on the Dutch one. It said that one of the guys who was involved at Heerenveen was like on holiday or something in, on Crete, the island of Crete where Sammy's from and mm-hmm. he was watching some sort of friendly match with one of the local teams and Samaras was there and he thought he looked pretty good, invited him over for a a trial and that was that he signed, he went over to Holland and signed him when he was 16 years old It's amazing how these types of things happen isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, so he, he followed them over stories. Yeah so, I mean, at this stage in his career, he was starting to look kind of like, I think, uh, obviously, Ibrahimovic had come out of uh, Holland at this point, and Samaras had a similar stature, so he was starting to get the kind of, like, uh, attention of all the 
clubs in Europe. Sevilla were linked with them at this point. Arsenal were linked with them. Arsenal are always linked with every youngster, and they, but they don't sign any. And then eventually it goes to Man City. So this is a Man City team that are finishing about 15th, 16th in the league. They're in the Premier Division at this point. They're getting managed by Stuart Pearce. And he goes into a squad that's made up with people like Claudio Reyna, Joey Barton, Robbie Fowler, Andy Cole, Darius Vassell, Trevor Sinclair, Willow Flood. Fuck's sake. And uh, <laughs> as I spoke about before we started, Kiki Masampa. So yeah, it was a kind of, when you think of Man City nowadays, obviously it's a lot different from then. They have a lot of forwards in the team. They have a lot of very British players as well. So it's a kind of un type squad that he's moving into. At Man City, he scores some goals. He begins not... I mean, it's going to follow Samurai throughout his career. He's not going to score that many goals, but he's going to get... He kind of seems to score a few goals at a time and then goes on kind of long breaks of not scoring. He got two full years at Man City under Pierce and then obviously Sven Goran Eriksson. He didn't show much. He only got eight goals in 50 games or something like that, around 50 games for Man City, and then was obviously made available on loan for us. And that happened in the January of 2008. And he actually signed... Does anyone know the who who signed on the same day as him? As Samaras with Celtic. Celtic. Barry Robson? No. Um, is it the same day as Samaras? Uh, you've got me. Who is it? Cookie Mizuno. Fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that was uh, the signings in uh, January. Uh, Cookie Mizuno and George Samaras. And this is a Celtic team at this point where you'll remember the, the, the Champions League campaign. We'd got, of course, we'd got Milan and Benfica and Shakhtar and Donetsk in the group. This is 2008. We had gone through and we were now... Facing, does anyone remember who we were facing in the last 16? Uh, of 2008? Oh, Barcelona. Barcelona, Barcelona yep. 2007-2008 season, we played Barcelona in the last 16. So, his debut, which is... Uh, I, one of the kind of debuts I can remember the most, I don't know about you guys, but can you remember the, the Kamarnock game away from home, 5-1 in the, in the cup? Yes, mm-hmm. vividly. I remember it for for a, a special reason, and the only time I've ever put this bet on was this game, and it came up. I put on Giorgio Samaras to be the last goal scorer in the match, because I knew that he'd just signed, and I knew that he probably wouldn't start. So I, I, for some reason I thought, I'm going to put him on last goal scorer, and it came up. What did you put so on? It's the only time I've ever made it. It was probably like a pound. <laughs> it came up anyway, so... <laughs> no, it would have been about ten or something, but I, I, was, I was delighted with that. But... I, I don't know about you guys, but do, what did you think when you saw him? I mean, he comes in from the right-hand side. We're one in 4-1. He's got those big fucking silly banana boots on. And he just fucking marches. I mean, it doesn't actually march. He glides across the box and then just... It's one of the most self-assured finishes that I've ever seen from a forward. And one of the kind of things that you barely seen Sam Raz do after that. He just never seemed to have that confidence anymore. No, but see... Sorry, Gary, on you go. No, I was going to say, like, um, whenever I do... Do these as well. Always the kind of first line. I always just try and brainstorm and think of a couple of words. Um, and one of the words I put in was gazelle, just because I think <laughs> the kind of poise. He had a weird kind of gait in the way that he ran. Um, that when it when it worked, it looked and like as you say, as that go and you know it kind of refreshed my memory when I saw it the other day doing the doing the research. But he had that ability. To, and and that's kind of part of the reason that he is so maligned. It's just because you'd see, you know, flashes of brilliance that you think this guy's a twenty million pound player, and then he would he would look the exact same, but fuck it up and look like a pub team player. And I think yeah. that kind of is he, he was kind of discombobulated all the time. He didn't really have everything together for an extended period of time. But when it did come in and. That goal's a perfect example. It just looks like a cut above anyone else on the field. Yeah, and I would I would say that he did like one of the things I, I do remember from this from from Zamarass's time was that he scored an almost identical goal against Kilmarnock at the same end, um, maybe about three years later. So I guess it was. I mean, when someone comes in and has a debut like that, and as you say, he glides past players. He's not even breaking sweat, and he strokes in. 
Um, it's a big, massive impression he makes. It's all, you always want, you know, a new guy, especially a foreign guy, a random exotic name to come in and hit the ground running. And he literally did that. And he comes in and he scores on his debut to win five one. So, what happens next, Graham? Well, I guess Gordon Strachan brought him in as a support because he came into a team. I'll just run through the team for that day. So this was the Celtic team at this point. Listen to this defence. Okay, so obviously we've got Arthur Boric, the defence. Paul Caddis at right back. Lee Naylor at left back. Steve McManus and Gary Caldwell in central defence. Uh, in midfield we had Donati, Megidi, Brown and Nakamura. And up front was uh, Jan Vinegar of Hesselink and Scott McDonald. If you want to hear more about Jan Vinegar of Hesselink, we have an earlier podcast. Which one was that number one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was the first one. Episode one. So throughout the the rest of this season, so obviously it's uh, the second half of the season. It was it was used in a kind of cameo role. He would come off the bench mostly, and he scored quite a lot of goals coming off the bench. He, he scored against Cali Thistle uh, in the February. Then he got one away at Hibs coming off the bench. One away to Gretna coming off the bench. And then there was a kind of big part of the season where it would perhaps kind of uh, show. Maybe Strachan's feelings towards McDonald in big games. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's a bit critical. But he actually came in for Scott McDonald in a Celtic Rangers game at Ibrooks, one that we could beat one 0 So he, Strachan actually started Jan Berger of Hesselink and Samaras for that one, and McDonald came off the bench. So he then scores against Motherwell off the bench, and Celtic get three in a row automatic entry into the, the group stage of the Champions League for the next year and everything's looking kind of uh, rosy in the garden. He goes back to Man City and Celtic sign him in the July of that year for, I think, I, I see it, some places are saying it was undisclosed between one and three million. Some places have said it was just one and a half million. I don't, did you see any, did anyone see anything different from that? No. No. No, I think it must have been probably about one and a half. So he joined in the same transfer window as Paddy McCourt, Mark Crossas, Glenn Leuvens, Sean Maloney and Matty Hughes. Does anyone know who Matty Hughes was? Centre half. I've never heard of him. Young centre half. From, cannot... Yeah, he was like, kind of similar to Josh Thompson, came from one of these lower league teams. I don't think he actually played any games for Celtic. Basically the English Milan Mizun. <laughs> nice. So just to jump in there, in terms of the... Us, us buying him. I do remember, like actually, the first time I'd ever seen his name, um, it was before Man City signed him, because I remember I'd read in the paper, I was speaking to Strachan, and he had mentioned that, you know, he was looking at Samaras, but as soon as, I think it was basically an article based on uh, how we couldn't really compete financially with the teams in the Premiership, and I, I know he was on a radar, and then City, City, City came in with six million quid and Celtic are like, well, we can't afford that. So I know that he'd been on the radar before. And obviously they've seen that he's not had a good time at City. So he's still been kind of been talked about um, because he obviously was having a bit of a shite time down there. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I'd seen an article about him on in like World Soccer or something like that. I remember him being mentioned a few times, but I'd, I didn't really know much about him before, before he went to Man City. Uh, but yeah, I mean that took us into the, the what would have been the fourth in a row season. Obviously, the Huns had just appointed Walter Smith. They'd just been to the EFA Cup final that uh, last season, and they were going to stop us getting four in a row this year. Uh, the, the the season in the whole was pretty disappointing, but it was pretty good for Samaras. He got seventeen goals this season, and it's probably I think looking back, it's his most prolific goal scoring season of, of, of his whole career. Uh, for Celtic, we do you remember this uh, Champions League campaign? It was the one with Villarreal, Alborg, and Man United. Yep, it was shite. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was fuck. It, it reminded me so much of the, the what was the last Lennon one? The last uh, Lennon AC one. Milan, AC Milan, and uh, one with Bal- Balotelli. Ah, uh, one with Balotelli scored. Barcelona. Uh, the, the, those two campaigns remind me of each other, man. Yeah, Ajax as well. Aye, aye. So, uh, this, so this was a this was a Champions League campaign where we we only got our first win in the last match day. I think uh, it was three, two 0 at home to Villarreal. And that was the season uh, that Alborg beat Celtic away. <laughs> Who the fuck are Alborg? We could beat three times away. Yeah, it's absolutely. <laughs> and they drew that night at Celtic Park as well, man. Yeah, yeah. The first, I think the yeah the first game in that that's that group was against Alborg. And let's be honest, have we ever heard of them since? 
No. Nope. no. And the, the the thing about that was that that was essentially as out of the Champions League. The, when we would see when we drew that each at at home, there's no fucking way we will come back. Yeah, you you go on and you play. You you get your your easiest game in the Champions League on the first game of of of, of the match 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 day whatever yeah. call it match day one. The next one is Villarreal away. The next one after that is Manchester United away. So to start in that manner with a zero zero against Alborg. I guess the writing was on the wall. You're yeah, you're out. You're in yeah. your ass. Yeah. Did you know that we've yeah. never won the first game of the group stage? Is that right? Uh, that's what I saw when I was doing the when I was doing the research. Um, aye, we've never won the first game in of the, any group in, stage. Of any group stage. So I think Alberg would have been your fucking shoot, your fucking tapping, and we managed to balls that up as well. Because because Martin and you would have been Juventus. Juventus and Bayern Munich away. Yes. Or was that was that the same? That was two different ones. Well, it? yeah. So the first one was oh one oh two. That is UV. I'm sure that's the one where the that Amoruso guy dived. Shocking. Uh, and uh, <laughs> the second one, yeah, you're right. It was Bayern, and we won nil up. And uh, fucking Headman. Headed aye, aye. Aye. the box. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's right. I sorry. I'm 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 looking Bayern Munich, Leon, and Anderlecht. Aye. aye. Two thousand three, two thousand four. Oh well, well. Hopefully next season. Uh, so the only the only kind of good point, apart from obviously Samurai's personal uh, record, there was the fact that we won the League Cup. Uh, we lost the league, we lost the Scottish Cup, and we had a dismal Champions League. So Strachan was out, and Tony Mowbray came in. Can I just ask, Graham? You said that he had his most fruitful season, uh, seventeen mm-hmm. goals. What was his? Where was he playing? If, if you managed to find that out, and who was he playing alongside? And it was always Strachan was always a four four two. So it was always either him and Jan Vinegar of Hisslink or him and Scott McDonald. It's an interesting front two, playing two big guys that are kind of similar in build. Although Samaras, for all his faults, was one of the fastest guys you've probably seen in recent times at Celtic. He was surprisingly fast. But So he played up front with, with Vinegar. Was he never really paired up front with anyone else like McDonald or even Sean Maloney? I know you would have McDonald as well, so he would just rotate. Obviously, McDonald. I think McDonald left pretty soon after this because he left. He went to Middlesbrough, didn't he? After Strachan, Strachan to took about so. eight players to Middlesbrough with him. Uh, I think he took Willow Flood as well. God bless him. Thank you, and Barry Robson. Barry Robson. Yeah, he took, he took a lot of those players down there, sort of done as a turn. <laughs> Graham, Graham, can I can I ask yep. like in in your research for that season, and you know, tell me if I'm wrong here, but. Was it not? I think it might have been Hesselink, but was there not like a massive period where basically none of them were scoring? I think it might have been like from like January to April or something like that. I think between them they got like two goals. They just went on like this. They seemed to go on like a dry spell, like just at the same time. Or could I be wrong there? I think I heard someone say that recently. I think maybe it might, might have been you actually in a, in a message or something, but I, I didn't notice it myself. I only noticed that he was scoring pretty consistently, but not. I never noticed any gaps where no one was scoring. But obviously, that would have been. Was that the season where we. Where Nakamura. Was that the season where Nakamura scored, or was that the season before? That was the season before. That was the season before yeah. the Rugby Park one. Because I remember that was taking us a long time to get over the line, but no, I oh, no that, that was two that. seasons before. So I, I thought you meant Nakamura goal against the Huns. No, it was a commander oh, one. That was 06, 07. Look at looking. I've got the the the. So we're talking about oh eight oh nine. Yeah, aren't we? yeah. So I've got the the results in front of me, and we did go round about February. We did go three games without winning, so we drew three back to back in the league. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there was probably a few. Uh, kind of gaps without goals getting scored. Two of them were nil nils against the the Huns and against Inverness Cali. Yeah, and then Motherwell and McDonald scored one. So yeah, that would have probably been the gap you're talking Un- about. Then. Unsurprisingly, like from what I've seen and knowing the type of player he was in terms of confidence and, and whatnot, he seemed to score in bursts as well. He'd go a few months without Aye. getting a goal, and then all of a sudden he'd just pop up with a good few. Funny you were saying that though, in February of that year in the SPL, we beat St Mirren 7 0, and McDonald, uh, Vinegar, and Samaras didn't score a single goal between them. Na- in, out of seven. I went to ask you, did he ever play any games up front with Ben Hutchinson? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. No. Oh, fucking hell, man. If you, let let, let me take you through this team that won 7 0, right? <laughs> Boric, Hinkle, Caldwell, McManus, Naylor, 
Nakamura, Krozas, Brown, McGady, McDonald, Samaras, Hesseling, Hutchinson on the bench, Fox, Leuven's Hartley, Flood. And the goals were from Nakamura. I think Nakamura got a hat-trick. Krozas, Brown. He did. Uh, Brown got two and there was an own goal as well. But it's... it's it's quite John Potter, he used to play for Celtic. Yeah, it's quite telling that, that none of them actually scored in that game. So McDonald, Venegur and Samaras all played in a game where Celtic won 7-0 at home and none of them scored. So that would probably add weight to what Gary's saying. I, I, I mean, that gap there, that's about five games. I just looked at there and uh, Venegur and Samaras didn't score between them. So, I mean, uh, we've spoken about Venegur before. I wasn't really his biggest fan. Uh, at least McDo- I think this was probably the season when McDonald was getting accused of being fat. Remember that? Remember he was getting accused of yeah. like, not being very professional and stuff like that. And I think it was around about this time where he was getting accused of being a leak to the media. Yeah, he was. Do, he do was. You guys remember of that? course, he's. He's. I mean, he's never been forgiven. We spoke about on the Craig Bellamy podcast about how McDonald was never like for, first and foremost for the helicopter Sunday thing he was never accepted as a Celtic player even though he was a Celtic guy and he scored a lot of goals but the rumours that came out that were I don't think there was any even sort of denial I don't ever remember hearing or, or seeing any sort of denial from him that he was the, the mole I think it was Keith Jackson who he was yes. given sort of bits and bobs to and it was quite clear and that, that probably indicates I always felt really, really strange about how he left Celtic. He was shown the back door, was Robbie Keane was shown the front door at the same time, if you remember, when Robbie Keane signed uh, and we shifted to him. We, we saw McDonald in the January, I think, and I always thought that was fucking snide, but things came to light since then with regards to the being a wee rat bag in that and, 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 and grassing on people uh, to the press. The way that the way McDonald speaks in the media nowadays as well, he he has no... Fondness for Celtic, you know, he, he just speaks like Craig Burley speaks, like, like someone who was just employed by us. Uh, to be honest, I, fact, I would prefer I prefer my pundits just to be one hundred percent honest. I don't care if if the if they're being critical of teams as long as it's warranted or they've got reasons to back it up. But when you get people who just say what they you know they just defend a team outright or they just lie to defend a team just because that's who their allegiances are with, I don't buy into that. I prefer them just to be one hundred percent. <laughs> no, he's just a fucking fat, fat, fat rodent. <laughs> Did I tell you about him getting paid in pies? Aye. <laughs> please, please do retell the tale. It's just that I, I know someone who uh, works in that, that area and apparently they get sponsored by or some kind of like deal with this McGee's pie shop or something like that. And apparently every Saturday he just goes home with like the big selection of pies at the end of the day. Not no entirely surprising. He literally eats all the pies. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Anyway, so as I said, Strachan was out. Mowbray was in. What were you guys thinking about this? Obviously, we've done the, we, the podcast on uh, Mowbray's kind of uh, the end of Mowbray. But what what were you thinking at the beginning, Gary? Um, when Mowbray came in, I, th- I think it was just one of those ones. You, you were. I, I probably would have had my reservations deep deep down. Um, I remember just thinking that it was weird that we were really chasing a manager that had just been relegated in twentieth place, um, in the in the Premiership. Um, you know, we seemed to because we paid quite. I think it was like two million quid for him and the whole staff as well. Um, so there was that, but I think it was just yeah. It just felt like it was time for a change. So people were like, I think eating after striking. I mean, it, to be fair, he ticked a couple of boxes when when you consider the mood of the mood of the fans at the time, because you obviously get some who are like, "Well, Stratton's not not a real Celtic man," which is I think a bit bullshit. But anyway, um, and also the fact that he was known for playing attacking football. Um, so yeah, I'd have been fairly hopeful. I mean, you're hopeful when any new manager comes in. I call it blind optimism, Gary. I, when when he came, <laughs> when he came in, and I remember saying this on the podcast. I'm always optimistic with 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 Celtic, especially, but um, especially when a, a manager comes in, it's not often we get a managerial change. You know, let's be honest. In your entire life, there's probably been about eight managerial changes, ten managerial changes in your entire life. So when they come in, I always give them the benefit of the doubt, and, I, and I'll, I'll kind of defend them as much as I can. I kind of done that. I had my back against the wall with dial at times, and I sort of defended them, probably beyond what was actually fair but yeah when when Mowbray came in I, I I was pretty optimistic quietly optimistic I wasn't shouting for the rooftops like it was with Brendan Rodgers but quietly optimistic I think is the best way to describe it 
Yeah, and I think uh, the kind of idea would be that he would be playing the, the Celtic way football as well. You know, like the fact that I remember people saying that he get relegated with West Brom, but he was playing good football. So I think a lot of fans were hoping that we were going to get this kind of attacking football after the kind of uh, turgid last couple of years of uh, Strachan's uh, reign. But it didn't start so well. Obviously, we had the, the home leg of the Dinamo Moscow game, which was uh, the Champions League qualifier for that year. Uh, Sam Ras misses a pretty clear-cut chance. For Cheney McDonald, missed chances as well, and we actually go down 1-0 at home, which is a pretty shocking result when you consider. Away from home, we, we obviously... Uh, the, 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 the result gets pulled, but pulled out of the bag by this goal. Just lashed forward. Samaras is there. Georgius Samaras wants to touch his great cross. Can he finish? Yes, yes he can! Georgius Samaras! His first European goal for Celtic. It's a historic goal for Celtic. Dinamo Moscow nil. Celtic so that, two. that goal there was in uh, injury time of the second leg. Obviously, McDonald has scored earlier on. Samaras came off the bench and scored what is... I mean, what do you think of that goal? I thought it was pretty beautiful. And obviously this podcast has, has history with this goal because <laughs> of the fucking the Celtic website. Yeah. Ari? Um, yeah, I remember... Well, I remember listening to the first leg. I, um, the first leg, I'm sure, was... Uh, I don't, I'm pretty sure it wasn't on telly, the first leg at home. And we got beat 1-0. And I, I remember being down the pub for the for the second game. And it's just one of those ones where um, we just we seemed assured away from home, which up until that point we never really had been. Um, whenever you watch Celtic in Champions League away, it was always like... I just, uh, yeah, I, It's just a horror show most of the time. I, I remember watching games and just wondering, right, how are we going to fuck this up in the first 10 minutes? Because it just seemed like any time we went away, the players played literally like they'd, like they'd just met. Um, and I, so yeah, I remember it was a quite a disciplined performance. That the, the Moscow team weren't really up to much, um, and I just remember the goal and just saying like, like, when's he going to fucking hit, like, hit it? But that's something I always found with Samaras as well, especially when looking at looking back at some of his goals. He never seemed to panic too much. Like, he never rush a shot um, to his detriment sometimes. But for that one, it's a perfect example of just keeping cool in the in the hardest of kind of situations. Was this the goal where he sort of traps it with his chest and beats about two players and then tucks it in the corner? Ah, uh, he goes, uh, it, it, it kind of glides across the box and you think that he's fucked up the chance and then he puts it across the bottom corner of the, the opposite side. Yeah, it's a, quite quite a, a bit of luck about that goal with the finish. I think it took a little bit of a clip, but aye, an amazing an amazing finishing uh, like. I haven't again. My disclaimer here: I haven't done any research, but I have watched his his goals compilation, and it doesn't have the usual trendy Euro cheese, Euro trance over it. Actually, <laughs> has some nice class, some really nice classical music over the back of this um, this piano classical music over the back of this uh, montage of Samaras goals, and it just works. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant. I, I'm going to tweet a lot of these out, um, but I what a goal! And I think the the one thing that I remember about that goal was I think it was just a a hit and hope boot for the halfway line right up in the air and it comes down and he catches it in his chest beats a couple of players and scores yeah I mean it wasn't as if we were at desperation stages because it was going into extra time so I mean it was but it was a welcome kind of uh, uh, pulling the result out of nowhere you know like it was it was. I think it was our first away win in a, a, some amount of years as well in Europe so yeah it was good to, good to see and I mean at this stage you're thinking man Tony Mowbray's going to turn us into a really good team. You know, I mean, he was backed heavily in the transfer market as well. At this point, you've got players like Zaluska coming in, Fortuny and Guemo, uh, Danny Fox came in, uh, Zeng, Zeng Zhu. Zeng, the, Zeng Zhi. The Chin- Zeng Zhi, the Chinese, the Chinese guy, and uh, Josh Thompson and Greg Spence come in, the youngsters. So, and by the, the, the summer transfer window, he's already signed a, a whole host of players. Samras, this season... Despite that early goal, he doesn't score that many. He gets twelve, but part of that is due to the fact that he's moved to a new position on the left wing. Some people preferred him over there, but I just don't know. But I don't know if Samras was ever a, the the correct player to be playing in the left wing of a four four two. Like I can see him being played in the left wing in like a Scott Sinclair type way. 
but not in a four four two. What did you guys think of him when he get moved to that position? Well, personally, um, sorry just to to interject here, but um, yeah, it seems like an unnatural when when it's a four four two. In my mind, a four four two is a very rigid system that there's no real scope for for overlapping or anything, and he just wasn't a an out and out left winger. And when you play four four two, and if you are on the left, then you have to be a balls out left winger. This actually brings me to a question that I was probably going to ask further down the line, but I'll ask you now. Both of you have done the research. Both of you have you know a lot of experience of watching Samaras over the years. What was his best position? Like, did did we ever come? Did anyone ever find out what his best position was? If you want to take that first, yeah. Um, I always found that. I mean, it's hard to say. I think. Yeah, that that kind of free free Roman uh, role. I think towards um, like in his best spells, he, he. I don't think he was ever great as the out and out striker. Like obviously, I think he was kind of tight cast in in the sense that you'd look at him and you go big, fairly fast. I thought he'd be a great target man, which I don't think he ever really was. Um, almost like kind of the 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 responsibility of doing that kind of weighed a bit heavy on him. Um, I always found that he he kind of performed best when he had a kind of dropping it a number ten type of but a kind of free roll kind of out 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 on the left coming in. Um, I, I always think he had his. I think he preferred to play with his back to goal and just doing little flicks on and you know little one twos and so on. So I always found that yeah, kind of like a, maybe a kind of attack mid left type of way, but with a kind of ro- like free free roll to roam around kind of as a two. To of the strikers, if that makes any sense. Yeah, Graham, what do you think his best position was? Did you uh, get to the bottom of it? What I what I thought, and uh, I think was sh- was shown the season after this was, I I would like to have seen him play in a kind of the formation that we play nowadays as the main striker, and a kind of more of a kind of like false nine main striker where that he he would be the one with the back to goal, taking it down in his chest, controlling the ball and then bringing your Rodgers, your Forests and your Sinclairs into into the game, you know, just the, the focal point at the front. I don't think he ever worked well as a front two because I just don't think he had the discipline to, to work well with a strike partner. And on the left, as long as he's in the position uh, that Gary you just described, that's fine with me, but if he's just in the left midfield then that's just I don't get why you would have him there, you know. Yeah, he's never a winger. Um, I always mm-hmm. think he he looked he always looked best when he had kind of it sounds obvious, but space to run into, like that way where he could stretch defenses, and that's why I think a lot of his and as we'll see later, obviously with the research done as well, that a lot of his best kind of moments come in come in Europe against a better standard yeah. of team, but and the game is perhaps a bit more tactical, and we we're not we're not camped in our team's half. He's got he's got space. Uh, to run in between the lines. One of one of the things that I my my friend always got upset with Sammy was the fact that he would sometimes get so he'd control the ball in the left wing, and then just go in this dribble. But he wouldn't dribble towards the goal. He would dribble across the park, and then just play like a five yard pass to the right winger. So it's as if instead of just passing the ball at the right winger, he just felt as if he was going to hand deliver it to him. This, and it was just like, what the fuck's the point of that, Sammy? Why did you do that? The, the, the answer that, I, that I, you know, I asked you this question and you've given me kind of vague answers, which kind of sums up Samaras's positional sense to an extent because I can't really pinpoint anywhere in the pitch where he would really, really, you know, be considered to play there all the time. A sort of a free role is the best way you can describe, just to give him the, let him go and play and do what he likes, like a big... Greek unicorn just going gallop about the pitch, but <laughs> it's it's very very vague. Like the answers were given, like it's kind of difficult to pin, like to pin him down, and that that is kind of like Samaras for me, um, in a nutshell. Very mysterious, very unmoved, but like when he wanted, not I don't want to say when he wanted. I don't buy into that. He's could have switched it on when he wanted, but when he played football, when he was he was up for a good game, like he was very very difficult to play against. Well, that's what I'm saying. Sorry, just to, and that's a question I kind of wanted to ask uh, you guys as well. Um, do you think that that's part of the problem of of George Samaras is the fact that you could never rely on him, especially if you're a very tactical manager, like like let's just say a Rogers. I don't think he'd be a Rogers type of player because he, that's exact that's exactly it. You can't really put him into a box and you can't really control how he's going to play. 
Uh, he might have a game where he destroys people and he's he's brilliant for you. And he might have a game where... And I think that's why he kind of suited Lennon's team. Because I don't think Lennon's team particularly was very tactical. We'd, we'd kind of rely on uh, your Commons and a Stokes or a Hooper, someone to pop up for us. And he was just kind of given a free reign at times just to go out and do his, do his business. But the, I suppose the question I'm trying to ask is, do you think that he would he would be a Rodgers type of player? I don't know, like... Uh... I'm I'm not sure. I would like, as I said, I'd like to see him given this formation because I think that he did his best work probably for the Greek national team, in a, in a lone striker position. But I don't know if he's got the kind of. I mean, when you look at the players that that Rogers has improved, then I don't see why not. I mean, I don't see why he couldn't do that. But it, it'd be hard to kind of look at the evidence of his Celtic career and say yes or no. You know, like it's just it's hard to tell. What do you think, Tony? Nah, I don't think he would have been catered for in this in this current setup. We have Rogers talks about players that work hard off the ball and do this and do that, and I just think big, the big man loved the slide tackle. He liked a slide. He, he liked his hair. He liked <laughs> the slide tackle. But I, I, I'm going to I'm going to start doing some like Timmy Bingo chat here. Um, a luxury player. He kind of a luxury player. Um, I don't think there would have been any any space for him in this current squad that we've got now. I just don't think he would be. Well, I mean, it's, obviously we're, we're only halfway through this podcast, so my my opinion may change come the end of it. But I don't think he would have the defensive to come back and and, and help out the defenders the way we have now with like Sinclair tracking back and and Forrest to an extent tracking back. I just don't think he would fit in. And as and I think Gary said that his. He sort of came into his own a bit more with Lennon because Lennon was a bit more erratic, not erratic, but Lennon was a bit more, a bit less tactical than other managers we've had. The, one of the, the these best performances for me was the, the what, you, I, I don't want to kind of uh, piss in Gary's chips, but the the Barcelona game. Uh, we can maybe save that for later, actually, because yeah. I, I assume you're going to talk about that. No, nah, go for but, it. The, the, Bas- the, the Barcelona game where we uh, we we went two one at Celtic Park, and I thought if you think of the his kind of tactical position in that game, I think we played a four one one in that match with uh, him and Miku up front. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember. Can you remember if it was Miku further forward or Samaras further forward? Yeah, it was. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Miku. It was the kind of lone striker, and Samaras was. I mean, we could say it's a four or four two, but. You know, I think we had like fucking twenty percent possession or something. So Samaras would have been like a kind of defensive forward, but yeah. No, and I just remember like him. He ran his fucking like he just he was all about the defense, aren't they, man? He just did everything that he could to stop that to stop Barcelona come forward. And then of course you've got the bit where he, where he gets subbed and Kyle's coming on and he points up to the scoreboard and tells him to keep it the same. You know what I mean? So he really had that kind of love for Celtic, but also. He had the awareness of the kind of defensive side when he needed to, so maybe, maybe it was more to do with the managers not getting the message across to him than him just not being able to do it. Mm, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think he could be onto something. I, I, I wouldn't say that because I think it would be making an excuse for him. Um, I think his career has shown that. I mean, surely all those managers couldn't have been couldn't have been wrong, and. Obviously, after he leaves Celtic, he goes to West West Brom. And I think well, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. If, no, no. I think he was signed by Irvine, but I think Pulis came in and just literally didn't didn't fancy him. And you, you know, the type of manager Tony. He's an anti Pulis player. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, there was there was a uh, I think it was a football weekly today or, today or something like that. And uh, Johnny Olsen's retiring, and someone said that will give Pulis a, a reason to sign three more centre backs. <laughs> Yeah, he probably he probably tried to retrain Samaras to be a centre back. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> fuck, that'd be a, that's an image. Uh, I, so I, I should probably get on with this season. Uh, I don't really have that much more to say about this season, but obviously we we got Arsenal in the next qualifying round uh, and get pumped five one. He started Samaras in the home leg and dropped uh, McDonald, and Craig Burley had this to say at the time. Uh, I don't rate Samaras. He hasn't done a great deal since he came to Celtic and he didn't do much at Man City either. McDonald can offer you something a bit different in the box, but Samaras won't. So some perils of wisdom from Craig Burley regarding that decision. We could beat, I think, a, a 5-1 in aggregate and that was us out of the Champions League. And Samaras finishes that season with, as, as I said, 12 goals, gets shifted to the left wing 
And if you want to hear about the rest of that season, then you've, we've got a podcast. What, what episode was that? About episode four or five or something? Which one? The Tony Mowbray one? Tony Mowbray one, yeah. Yeah, first, first three or four. Yeah. The, the, road, the, the, the road to... What was it? Road to Paisley. The demise of Tony Mowbray. <laughs> a good book. It's like a good book, yeah. that one. <laughs> uh, aye, so... Obviously, Lennon comes in... Uh, Sorry, sorry. Can I just jump in there? Just because I remember, I just remembered something about that season. Uh, two things, rather. The the New Year game against the Huns. Um, I remember that game because we fucking battered. It was it was one all it finished, and we absolutely battered them. Um, and McDonald scored, and then straight away, that fucking elbows McCulloch scored from a scored a header from a corner. But I remember that game for a couple of reasons, and it was uh, in Guemo. I had a fucking stormer. I thought I thought he was brilliant in that game, and Samaras played up front with Fortuny, and they he was brilliant. Like both of them just ran them ragged. The, but the problem was obviously you had two players who were quite similar, and they also weren't really fond of scoring many goals. So <laughs> despite the fact that they absolutely horsed that orc defence, they still couldn't. They they still didn't really. Um, Change that into change, convert the dominance into into any tangible results. But but I remember he had a, a fantastic game there, um, and he also played against Ross County. He was also he also I mean the whole team again. This is kind of what uh, kinda, are you talking about the cup match? Yes, the Ross County yeah. semi uh, semi final, where yeah. um, that's kind of like the theme. So if Celtic play shite and the whole team plays shite. Samaras, if he's in the team, he gets this. He gets a stick for it, and it's like a oh, fucking Samaras typical. Da, da 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 And you're just thinking, well, I mean, it's eleven players on that park, but I do remember he was particularly woeful that day, as the whole team were. I think he missed a he missed a pretty bad chance when it was uh, either nothing each or one 0 It is still so. Uh, I he missed a pretty bad chance in that one. But I, the, one thing I was going to say about that season also was I came back. I think this was like my first Celtic game since uh, since moving away. It was Falkirk, uh, Brockville. Is it? Bro- it's not called Brockville anymore. What's it called? Cal- is it Caledonian? No, no, it's that's Inverness Cali. Fuck knows. Whatever the, the the Falkirk Stadium, whatever it is, uh, and see see the the if you I don't know if you've been to the the one they're playing at the moment, but see the 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 stand that the camera's in. It's essentially like ten rows, so it's like it's almost like a temporary stand that goes along the the side of the park. You don't see it when it's on TV. And I was standing in there, maybe about three rows from the back, and Samras was on that wing. And for the full 45 minutes, he get abuse from every section of the Celtic support. Every time he touched the ball, it's just nothing. Would, that was a game where Robbie King got the double. Mm-hmm. And it was just relentless. Any time he touched the ball, the Celtic fans were on top of them. And but it, and that's one thing we spoke about earlier. This idea that he didn't hide, and he didn't hide that day. But nothing was going for him at all, man. It was just he was fucking standing. And, you know that gif that sometimes people use for samurais with the the horse that's trying to control the big beach ball. <laughs> yes, it, it was exactly like that, man. Every time he got near, near the ball, uh, so I mean, it, it, I, as you said with the Ross kind of thing, it was just if the team wasn't performing well, he was a scapegoat straight. Falkirk, away. I've, I've managed to find the name of the stadium. Are you ready? Falkirk Stadium. I think it's called. I was right, the Falkirk Stadium. <laughs> yeah, I, I miss Brockville. Who was the guy that had, was it? Did Chris Waddle at some point? Did not? Russell yes. Latipi? Falkirk. Russell Latipi. Was it. They had a guy that was called Crunchy. What was his name? Was it Kevin, Kevin McAllister, McCall? yeah. Fucking Home Alone. Guy from Home Alone. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin! <laughs> uh, so so uh, where, where does that. Where, where, where are we? Where are we currently now, Graham? Which which season? Which which um? Where are we? What what is the year? We're about to come up to now ten eleven, which is Lennon's first full season in charge. We're about to be pumped at Champions League by Braga. Right. Okay. Lennon obviously gets quite a bit of budget. Brings in quite a few players. We start with the game against Braga. We get host. We go into Utrecht. We play them at Celtic Park. We beat them two 0 and Sam Rice scores this goal. I don't have a clip for that, so I don't know why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. I forgot. I, don't <laughs> I forgot. I don't have a clip Continue. for that. Continue. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so Samaras scores in the two 0 victory at Celtic Park, and not only that, he was instrumental in the the the, the first goal for Ephraim's 
Efren Juarez. Uh, he dummies the ball for Juarez to score the first goal and then Samra scores the second. Efren! And then, <laughs> obviously, we have the uh, capitulation in Holland. Uh, was it 4 0 we could beat? Right? Yeah, against yeah. Utrecht. I they, they absolutely. I, I, I remember the Utrecht game at home. It was Kyle's debut, and I'm pretty sure he came off the bench in the debut, and he looked fucking absolutely. Yeah, no, he actually started the game. I'm just looking, but I was at the game, and he, he started the game, and he was fucking absolutely brilliant. He was so fucking good in this home leg against Utrecht, and then he gets subbed for James Forrest, and he got a stand innovation. I, I mean, Kyle, yeah. that. That game at Ibrooks that's going to be coming up soon. That Kaya was that was one of the best material performances I'd seen in a long time, and I thought Kaya was going to be. A As player. we were just saying, like he in the background here, Spain have just beaten Israel four one. Kaya and Beaton nowhere near the squad. Israel made three subs, none of them to be seen anywhere. Celtic connection, set, letting them down, man. I saw what was it, Ricky Van Roos? Ricky Van Roos, Van Roos Winkle. Ricky Van Roos Finkel. And then, was it Norwich he went to and scored one goal in 30 games or something? Aye, uh, yeah, he was, he, was he was there with Hooper and both of them couldn't, couldn't hit a cow's ass with a banjo. Aye, aye. So, uh, Samaras was kind of similar. He only scored three more goals in 2010. Obviously, he's not playing up front at this point. He's on the left-hand side, so it can't really be expected. But this is going into January the 2nd, 2011. We're going to Ibrox. I think this was probably the least confident I'd, I'd felt Celtic had been in a long time going to, to Ibrox. What did what do you guys remember about that one? Um, yeah, similar. I know we'd, we'd been on a shite run. Um, there was a f- few games in December where we won last-minute goals, scrappies, anything. Um, I, know we'd, I know we'd had a few injuries, and that's kind of why Samaras got the nod for this game, because he was a wee bit out of the picture. Um mm-hmm. And if you look at the lineup we had that day, it was a bit. I mean, obviously now we we see Mulgrew as a centre back. I'm pretty sure Mulgrew started at centre back that game. No, I could be he wrong. didn't. Mulgrew played left mid. This was. Oh, this yeah, is the yeah, game. Right. That, and Paddy McCourt as well. This is the game where the two 0 Samaras game, which everyone remembers. But Charlie Mulgrew, I'm 99% sure Mulgrew played wide left because we played Kelvin Wilson. Or was it Mark Wilson? We had Milson, Wilson, Mistorovic, Izagiri, Mulgrew and Ronya. So that tells me Mistorovic, Ronya were in centre defence. This is the game. I'm kind of uh, pissing in your face here a wee bit and like jumping on your wave. But um, <laughs> like I, I remember this game more for Charlie Mulgrew starting and going, oh, for fuck's sake, no, left wing, oh, for yeah. fuck's sake, no. And then obviously the rest as it happens. Um, but aye, Gary, back to you. Um, no, it's just I remember... Yeah, it was just one of those games, and I think the Huns had been been playing fairly well at the time, and it was just yeah, it just seemed like everything was kind of gone, and the the you know the jury was very much out on Lennon, um, because obviously you know been at this point up until now, and Celtic had been been quite shaky at certain times, so yeah, I, I remember that, but I always think these things like you've always got, just, even if you're not doing particularly well. As has recently been fucking shown with the with the new incarnation, like it, these type of games, you can always get a result from somewhere. I think that that patch that you were talking about was in November. In December, it was three home games we played. We drew one each with Dundee United, two each with this Cali Thistle, and one each with Command. Like that must be a record. That we're, three three SPL games we haven't won at home in a row. So. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't looking good in the build-up to this game. When, was, when was this, sorry? What 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 month was that you just mentioned there, Graham? That was November going into December. Ah, right, okay, because I was looking at December. Uh, December's not much better as well. If you look at it, December 2010, which is the 2010-2011 season, there are three games postponed in a row. Aberdeen, Celtic, Celtic, Kilmarnock, Hamilton, Celtic, all postponed. And then we draw with Kilmarnock and we sort of continue. We actually have a, yeah, one, two, three games in a row where we... Um, draw and then we finish the year on top of the league by one point uh, beating Kilmarnock so I beaten Motherwell 1-0 and I've just had a quick mm-hmm. look I, this is just something that I've sort of gleaned right this second uh, who did Celtic sign <laughs> uh, the 1st of January or actually the, the 29th of December of that year do you remember <sighs> Celtic Wiki r- Rapid uh... I'm not. I'm not checking or anything. I can hear the clicks. <laughs> no. 
It's <laughs> no, I've got no idea. Freddie Lundberg. <laughs> Oh, oh brilliant! <laughs> what was it? What was the cup game that he played? Oh, was it not like breaking yeah, or something like that? Sun, Sun Ra, I think Sun Ra was it not? Yeah, uh, Berwick Rangers. Aye, Berwick Rangers two 0 That was bleak. Uh, I, I, remember, I remember the pyro I, that, from that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's one of the first games I saw pyro at Celtic. At a Celtic game, I was like, no fucking way, man! Uh, <laughs> and that and that uh, Rangers game was my, my last my last visit to that fucking midden. Uh, my last viewing of that fucking deep team so it was great to see it was one of the best atmospheres that I've ever experienced at, at, at Ibrox the Celtic Symphony was amazing there was a, a bit where Paddy McCourt went like, two, fo- two footed through someone but got the ball and it got the biggest cheer of the day it was just no one expected it man like so even see when Sam Rascott so if you remember the goal which everyone uh, remember like you have to this, 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 for me, this is that the, when you think of Samaras, Samaras Sunday, like one of the some, like I, I've been given a lot of tweets, um, Doctor J from the Spell the Glove podcast. When I says like, what do you remember from Samaras? Everybody on Twitter, Sammy Sunday. Oh, well, let's let's remind people of it now. David away to Ledley. Samaras is chasing this, and McGregor's come way out. Giorgio Samaras scores for Celtic. Happy New Year to the Hoops! Horace now for Samaras. Cut by Ness. Still going Samaras. What oh. down penalty Celtic! It is Samaras. It is 2-0. He is the man of the moment. What a way to start a year so, for Celtic. Ledley obviously gets the ball. Deep in his own half, Bailey looks up and then just seems to kind of wrap his left foot around it, and uh, Samaras is on his way. I remember when uh, Samaras got past, uh, what's he called? What's he? Alan McGregor. And you, you think and he's going to miss? I thought, I like, yes. I thought, don't take it first time. Don't take it first. I didn't have any confidence in him taking it first time. I was like, fucking compose yourself, get it onto your right foot, and score. And he just fucking rattles it in with his left. But that's quite yeah. telling because <laughs> the fact that if it was a, obviously if it was a Gary Hooper or a Stokes, you wouldn't have thought that. But Aye. the fact, and I, I remember the exact same thing. I remember almost like shiting myself after they got past McGregor because I'm like, right, there's actually something that you could fuck up here. Like Aye. genuinely, Aye. that's that's that was that was my mind because you know if, if he's got the ball, fuck, like obviously before he knocked it past uh, McGregor. You're thinking, well, this could be a chance or not, and then when you realise how much of a chance it was after he'd uh, knocked it past him, that's when you began to actually worry because of his, Aye, because, just because of the type of player that he was. And uh, just the scenes after, it's just walking into the fucking crowd, and then it just it disappears. The guys try to put his hat on him and everything, man. It was just brilliant. That was such such good scenes, man. Uh, but obviously, so that's the sixty second minute, and then it was only eight minutes later where he gets. That describing that kind of uh, the build up to that goal as well. I mean, what is it? Is the halfway line? I think it is. It is it Wilson or Forrest that plays the ball down the line to him? Uh, I think it might have been Forrest. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Was it not like a kind of weird scissor kick volley? Like it was one of those ones. Where he, on yeah, own. it was a it, it was a pass, and then he like kind of scissor kicked a pass into Samaras, but Samaras was still like on the on the halfway line, like Aye. no danger at all. Apparently, and then it just rinses. I think it's is it Ness or something like that. Some, he, he, beat, he some beats Ness on the right, and then cuts inside, yeah. and then sort of does a lollipop on the ball right in the, the left hand side of the goalkeeper, where uh, Griffiths tied the, the thing to, uh, at Christmas. Uh, there does a lollipop. He's inside the box, and he just gets half. It's Craig Thompson. There's no hesitation. There's actually no arguments for the Huns either, because. It's an absolute stonewaller. Ah, it's because was what is it? David Proven says a, a stonewall penalty every day of the week or something like yeah. that. He says at that point. If he says it, uh, was it Bagheera? Wasn't mm-hmm. it? Yes, it was Bagheera. Yeah. I'd see personally. See, and then again. Uh, sorry, on you go. So, on you so go like pers- personally for me, like like as it stands, one of my one of my favourite moments as a Celtic fan, I guess, and and probably now I'm thinking about it, is arguably my favourite Sammy moment ever. Is the the first goal celebration that you spoke about. Like it, it, it's funny if you look at back Celtic's bench is like Juarez, uh, 
Krosas, Stokes and Hoyfeld and they're going absolutely tonto and he jumps into the crowd, he leaps the board and jumps into the crowd and it's a very, like Samaras for me was a very reserved player, very within himself, very, was not, he seemed like a really quiet character but he vaulted that, he, he fucking vaulted the, the, the boarding and then leaped into the crowd and it's absolutely iconic. I've actually got a picture of it in a frame up in my house just now and uh, the celebrations are amazing. The guy's taking his flat cap off, putting it on his head. Hoyveld's going bananas. Uh, Niall McGinn's going fucking mental as well. It's just an absolutely fantastic moment. It's kind of out of character almost for Samaras because he's a very, even when he scored against Barcelona, it was a sort of just a little walk away, like kind of Thierry Henry style nonchalance. It was, it, it, it was similar to when Nakamura scored against Kamarnock, you know, when he, he jumped into the crowd for the first time, with the yeah. free kick. Uh, it was similar to that, because Nakamura was always kind of reserved as well, but then he just fucking... Was that another one he has? He's, he's tap half Bernice Heed, taps half crew coming through, like actually <laughs> doing, doing windmills with his tap. He's wearing, a wee, he's wearing this little white fucking, wee fucking nicotine stained vest, and he's just bouncing into the crowd. It's absolutely brilliant. Aye, uh, brilliant. Aye, uh, so, and uh, again, I, I don't know about you guys, but I thought, he's missing this penalty. <laughs> he's, he's, not, he's never scored this penalty. I, I wanted someone else to take it. His confidence was up. Yeah, then, it, it'd have been typical Samaras in many ways just to be like, do something sublime, get do something sublime for the thing, and then, you know what I mean, just something to pull you back and go, oh, fuck, like, your nose, you're no great. But, like, uh, at that time, you know what I mean, because cause he hadn't, and I think this that goal and stuff like that kind of kick start something. I, I reckon if he didn't have that performance, he'd have been gone, and we wouldn't be doing this podcast. Is this not his first uh, goal of the season? So. Yeah. No, no, he scored. This is his first goal of the, obviously the year because it's only two days old. But he scored uh, four goals before that. that right. Season. Okay. Some of the tweets. I think yeah. one of the tweets maybe indicated this was the first goal of the season, which I thought was maybe true initially. Um, do you think this game and this this New Year game against Rangers, uh, um, Mordor? Kind of is his number one moment. Do you agree with that? That for me, that and the uh, one that you're going to talk about later, probably the Spartak Moscow header. That for me was fucking. That was that was our first. What was that away Champions League points? In like thirty two games yeah. or something. Like. I think uh, that was a fucking lost. I was watching that at a pub in Vienna, man, and I lost my shit. I think, really. and uh, I think on paper, if you took it on paper, you'd say the Spartak Moscow when you think about the significance of it. And the fact that uh, it's a first win and stuff like that away from home, and after like twenty attempts or something like that, and it's um, of the of the Champions League proper rather. But I think if you, I mean, you just need to ask yourself, like the from the reactions you've seen on Twitter and what everyone's saying, that's what he is remembered for. You know, what I mean, he, mm-hmm. on paper, yes, absolutely, I'd say Moscow probably shades it. But if you think of just sheer emotion and memories and the fact it's a derby and just everything about it, I think, I think definitely it's definitely the most symbolic thing that he's that he's done. Like as you say, him running into that crowd, like that's an image that that stays with you. Aye. and I think what it did show was Samaras for me would have been perfect for a, a lone striker and a counter attacking team because two those those both of those goals come from him basically counter attacking. You know, it was like. Rangers had the ball down their side. We played it long to Samaras. He scores the first time. He wins the penalty the second time. You know, it just seemed to be that was what he was suited for. You to know? think that we we went to Ibrooks with Mistorovic, uh, Wilson, Mulgrew, Ronya, McCourt, even Samaras at this stage to go and to go to Ibrooks and come away with a two 0 win. It says quite a lot. Right, right, definitely, yeah. But that season. It wasn't to finish in that kind of high because obviously we had to play Rangers like six times that season and uh, the most important time was the 24th of April where we get a penalty. At the time I wasn't too worried so we were one point behind Rangers at this point but we had a game in hand. Is that right? I think Rangers... I think so. I, I think I, I remember. Yeah, I think that is right. On the, on this uh, yeah. this nil nil game you're talking about at Ibrox, the return leg after the split... Um, Rangers finished. The, the game was nil nil, so we stayed on the same points, and they were one point ahead. And there was five, yeah, and we and we have a game the, in hand, and there's five games left. Yeah. Aye, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So, I remember not being too pissed off at this because I felt we. I think it wasn't a penalty. Is that right? It, it shouldn't have been a penalty. Uh, anyone, anyone it's fifty fifty. Like, uh, it was soft. Yeah, soft. 
I can re- just remember my fucking naive head thinking, oh well, he's missed. So Samaras obviously misses the penalty and I was thinking, well, we want to win it the fucking proper way anyway, you know what I mean? Not win it with a fucking soft penalty. Looking back now, I was I would think to myself, don't be so fucking stupid, we should have won, we should have taken the victory and won with a soft penalty, but... Yeah, I, I, the thing is, I think he, he, had, he had it well. I mean, it was a fucking good save. Um, yeah. And that's what people don't really think. It wasn't like it was a shite penalty. I, it, it was obviously the same corner, and I remember thinking, uh, I think McGregor saved a few of them, and he always he always tended to go the same way with his penalties. Mm-hmm. He always went to his left. Um, so I remember thinking maybe like a Stokes would have been good to hit that penalty. Um, oh. But, yeah, I, 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 I think it'd be harsh on him to, to blame him for <laughs> it, because I, I, think he struck, I think he struck it well, it was just a good save. See, and at the end of the day, that's not what fucked us. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Inverness Cali fucked us. So it's it's not the this is, the league was still in our hands with five games to go exactly and we, we threw it away so so Inverness Caledonian Thistle was the that was two days later. yeah so the uh, two games yeah the later. big game so what happens then well uh, we get beat three two we're three one down until injury time an awful awful game which just didn't show anything I uh, yeah. I think Common scored in the injury time to make it uh, make it a more respectable scoreline but. Apart from that, we get pumped. Yeah, uh, and, and that was in. So Commons, end of the season. So basically. Commons kind. Wait, Commons comes in that January. Yes, Commons comes in that. It's interesting that Commons comes in that January of the two thousand eleven that that Rangers game, and then sort of uh, things kind of change. Yeah, because I remember going to the semi final at Hamden when Commons played, but yeah, he comes in in uh, that season and. He didn't actually play. I'm not sure if he was signed in time for the Rangers game, but yeah, you're you're right in saying that the the game goes down like the, the league kind of is lost at that three two a loss to Inverness Cali in the fourth of May. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I don't think Sammy can be blamed too much for that, as you as you were saying. But that takes me to the end of my uh, research of the first three and a half seasons. So against Gary, it's over to you. Thanks for downloading. This is part one of the Samaras podcast. And part two will follow on Sunday evening with a roundup of the Hearts game and hopefully a league win for Celtic. Cheers.